Hello, dear community, and very welcome to our live talk on scaling in the USA. We have two excellent start startups with us with a lot of experience on the topic, and Jan Bruckner from the US Embassy in Austria, Vienna. Jan, welcome to our studio, and thank you for organizing this talk. Thank you very much uh, for having me. From New York, Susanne from Midfox, the founder in from Austria. Hey, Susanne. Hi, very nice to meet you. And from Bucharest, uh, Michna uh, Kalin from Coda Intelligence. M Michna, hello. Nice to see you guys. Nice to hello see you. everyone. Jan, um, let's start with a question. Why did you invite these two startups to our um, show today? And what are we going to talk about? What yeah. is your role in also connecting startups, helping them to scale in the USA? Abs absolutely. Just a very quick intro from my end, that uh, audience has idea who I am. So uh, my name is Jan Bruckner, I'm working at the US Embassy's commercial section, um, the head of, or let's say the lead for technology, and very much focusing on supporting startups in Austria in setting up and expanding in the US. And I wanted to have two, let's say, case studies or very successful founders uh, to join this session. And uh, definitely Susanne from Meatfox is the best case study that we could have. And Mishna from Coda Intelligence is um, basically one of our clients. So my colleague Monica in Bucharest worked closely with Mishna and he has been at one of our programs. And I think it's always best to hear directly from a company that went through the process to share their do's and don'ts, their learnings. That's basically the background. And Susanne, I think I know you now from four or five years, first time we met at the 4 Game Changer, and then you had this great success story. You get uh, on board to the, of the Tech Stars uh, Accelerator and now living in New York. So I think the best um, yeah, case study that we could have right now. Okay, so let's, let's uh, case study you, Susanne. Um, any, 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 uh, or how, were you, how were your steps when you were approaching the US market? Let's start on that level, and then we'll deep dive into the do's and don'ts and learnings about it. Sure. Um, yeah, so I started um, Meat Fox in Austria and uh, then decided to move to the US around a year and a half ago, so right before the pandemic. And the reasons for moving to the US was basically that we realized that the Austrian and German market was just not as ready for our solution as the, Austrian, uh, as the US market was. And uh, we started off with just running some ads and figuring out if maybe our solution was better accepted in the US. And we realized that it was actually true that uh, the US market was much more ready for our solution. Um, maybe just a quick background, Meatfox offers an uh, independent professionals an all-in-one solution to handle online meetings and get paid for online meetings with your clients. And so um, we just realized that the US market was um, doing that already a lot. And they were very accustomed to having video calls with their clients. They were also very used to offering the appointments online. Um, and when we were trying to sell our service in, in Austria, we always heard the same excuse that, oh, no, my clients want to meet me in person. And no, my clients don't want to book a meeting online with a click. They want to call me or write me an email. And so we all the time heard a lot of um, negative um, feedback for our solution. And that was the core reason why we decided to move to the US. Um, then, of course, the pandemic hit and suddenly the whole world moved online, which um, was giving us a boost, but at the same time, it made that move to the US a little less relevant because now suddenly we're also seeing a big increase in Germany and Austria again as the whole world became more ready or more uh, transitioned more into this online world. Um, but yeah, we, we were lucky because um, we were able to, to grow during the pandemic, and that was also why we were accepted to the Techstars program that Jan just mentioned in New York City, as well as the Venture City program, uh, which is in Miami. So we did both programs at the same time. Um, and unfortunately, they were both virtual, so it also worked out to do them at the same time. And we have since grown our team to 12 people. Uh, we have two people in the US at the moment, and the remaining 10 are spread all around the world, uh, mainly in Austria. Tell us but that's kind of how we are split right now. Um, why did you apply for those two programs? We, ha we had a clubhouse session yesterday and, and a lot of advice around um, how to enter or how to attract or approach the venture capital, for example, in the US. And a lot of people said through those programs of incubators and accelerators, you have a, a sort of entry point into the whole investment scene. Was that the reason in Meat Fox case? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, I do think that if, if you want to be successful in the US, it is very difficult to um, do so if you don't have a strong network of people. And even though I believe it is easy to create a network in the US, uh, much easier than in other places of this world because people are very open and you have this very strong startup ecosystem. At the same time, you want to really create the right network. And that is sometimes a little more challenging. And these programs really get, give you access to great mentors, great investors. Uh, they make sure that you are on the right track when going to the US. And I think that this, this whole network is just invaluable. And that was the core reason why we decided to do the program. Before we move to Michna, um, what were your first steps when you went to, to New York? I mean, any, any, any down to earth advice to any other founders that want to move there? What do you start with? Sure. Uh, I mean, I would start with really doing some market research. Um, we, for example, run ads, as I just mentioned, and really and try to understand the customer base that is in the U.S. and um, test our product first. And um, we then had to, unfortunately, um, do a flip to a U.S. company, which is a, it's not a nightmare, but it's not easy to do. And it does require a lot of um, lawyers, um, expertise and, and tax expertise, and et cetera. Why was Maybe that necessary? To, did, you have to, did you have to change the, the, um, your, yeah. your company form? So we had to change uh, because the U.S. investors were only interested in investing in a U.S. company and they were not so keen on investing in an Austrian company. We had to create a U.S. Inc. And then we had to, so to say, flip and that's what they call it, the flip um, the, U the Austrian company to the U.S. and basically put the Austrian company as a subsidiary of the U.S. company. And this whole process um, sounds easy, but it just takes a lot of time. So one probably tip that I would have is if you are seeing that um, the U.S. is the right market for your product, I would definitely think about the company structure up front because raising money with a foreign company is much more difficult in the US. And um, I think we could have saved a lot of headaches if we didn't have to go through all of that. However, it's also, it is doable. So even if you are an Austrian company right now, I don't think that should hinder you from going to the US or raising money in the US. It just is an additional step that um, was a little surprising to me how, how big that step actually was for a tiny company that we were at that stage. Yeah. I just basically can underline what you just said, uh, Susanna. So starting early, doing your homework is such an essential topic, especially if you're, for example, a company that has a lot of regulatory issues in healthcare or fintech. You have to go through a very long process, for example, healthcare, getting FDA clearance and so on. This takes a couple of months, years, and doing the homework early, getting prepared, having a U.S. squad uh, that is working in um, B-weekly, weekly shifts, has targets and really constantly focusing on how to do the next step is, is really essential to make a kind of go or no go decision. Yeah, mm -hmm. So it is, it's a very valid point. Thanks. Okay. I also think that sometimes it's maybe not as relevant to go immediately into the US market. Maybe you can do a lot, especially now with, with the pandemic and the world that we are living in. It's so easy to um, enter the market without physically being in the market because you can have already investor meetings, you can have client meetings, and people don't really care if you are around the corner or if you're on a different continent, because you are anyways only meeting via video right now. So that is also something to consider, the, the timing of moving to the US. Knowing the Austrian um, company forms, probably you had a game uh, limit, limited liability company. If you compare that to the US Inc., is the US Inc. an expensive, a bureaucratic company? What, what's your uh, first impression on that? I would say creating an Inc. is very easy, and um, the, the whole process is super easy to, to, to build a company. Um, you have a lot of programs for startup founders that help you throughout the process. Um, I think for us, it was a little bit of a more complicated situation because we already had the German company, already had IP that was created there. So that process um, was seemed to me very complicated. But I think if you're just starting off a company in the US, it's, it's very quick and, and easy to do so. Michna, how was that in your, your case? Why did you decide to go the US and how were your first steps and your learnings? Did you also have this issue of a company form? 
Well, I think uh, it's it's uh, something like ninety nine percent the same experience because <laughs> um, uh, we incorporated also in Romania. We developed product, and then we we went to uh, test the market in the U.S. The only difference that we had was that we didn't go through an accelerator. We used Select USA as our uh, let's say foot in the door. Uh, with uh, uh, getting um, good good uh, uh, people, uh, a good network there. Uh, we had the same issues, the same uh, issues with incorporation, the same issues with the flip. Uh, the actual flip for us was, uh, was impossible uh, in, in the seed round because we had an EU-based uh, uh, financier uh, 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 VC and we also had a U.S. based one, and they couldn't put money. They, well, well, the U.S. one wanted the money in the U.S. The EU wanted um, the, the money in the EU, uh, Europe, uh, European Union. So we chose the one in Europe. But we're planning to do this flip uh, in the Series A that we forecast by the end of this year. What I would add to what Suzanne said. Uh, maybe a, 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 a huge difference. Uh, uh, the, the reason why we went to the States is the same because uh, we are in the cybersecurity space and cybersecurity is something uh, still uh, early in Romania. So uh, the market is not that big, but in the US is something extremely relevant and extremely uh, desired. And we, we, we chose to go to the U.S. Um, the, um, the openness, as, uh, as Suzanne stated, the openness of the people, the easiness to, to reach and to have discussions, uh, it is there. Uh, a, a, I think a, a relevant point is uh, also to know that the U.S. market, I think, I, as I have experience, I have experience in selling in the U.S. as well as in Western countries, and I, I perceive the U.S. as one of the most uh, uh, competitive selling countries in the world. They have one of the best. I, I, I think they have a a a, a good uh, prep for for sales, which means uh, penetrating that market uh, pushes you to to upgrade your 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 uh, sales level because otherwise um, as uh, as Suzanne stated a, an incorporation service can be uh, from 1k to 30k a, uh, uh, a, a any service can have can have a, a huge wide spread of prices which of course in in the startup game makes you want to be extremely uh, careful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Jan, uh, maybe just to clarify, uh, Select USA is a permanent uh, support program from US Embassy only in Vienna or, or, yeah. or globally? Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for asking. So to give a short background, um, the Embassy, or I'm working in the Embassy's commercial section, which is part of the so-called Department of Commerce, um, the Handelsministerium in, in German. And uh, one program supporting international companies, so not only from Austria, uh, is the Select USA program, which we offer on all year round. And it's all about helping companies that think about setting up a presence or expanding their existing presence in the US and trying to make this step as easy as possible. Um, we offer tailored services free of charge, um, confidential if needed, um, and really everything from um, market research about um, where to set up, how to find employee number one in the US, what are local incentives, introduction on a state level, because each state is different. Each state has different support programs. So we are a kind of door opener to get access to the, let's say, social capital that the financial capital will follow, so clients or investors will follow. And we work with all kinds of companies. Um, it could be a small one, it could be a big one, existing investors. So in, we have at the moment, I find it really impressive, 800 subsidiaries of Austrian companies in the US. Wow. And some of the big names, um, like First Alpine, are of course there, but also an uh, increasing number of startups. And we have offices in 80 countries around the world, and uh, Mishnah has been working with Monica, 
uh, one of my colleagues. Um, I'm mainly responsible for Austria and I have colleagues that are covering other sectors. So, so we have a sector expertise and just try to support where it is necessary. necessary. And, and once a year you have your flag, flag, flagship event, uh, this year virtually in June. Can Absolutely. you give us just a short yeah, sure. on that? So the Select USA Summit, it's called, is our absolute flagship event. It's happening this year from the 7th to the 11th of June. So five days virtual event sounds a lot, but it's mainly the afternoons in our time zone. And there basically you can learn all the ins and outs how to do the strategic step to market of the market entry or expansion in the US. And we have a very specific Select USA tech program, which is catering all startups um, and what they get is basically um, they can virtually exhibit in the, at the summit. They get, learn everything about the U.S. startup ecosystem, about how to raise funding, how, what's the issue with regard to IP. Um, basically, every question can be answered. And we have a lot of accelerators there, VCs there, all kind of service providers that try to help this step and make it a little bit easier than without. Uh, and so I can strongly recommend it for companies that think a U.S. market entry is a strategic step and is important for them and they would like to focus on. Michna, how was it for you? Did you just knock on the door in, in Bucharest or maybe just to give us some, some insights? Uh, we, we, prior to CODA, uh, we, I, I was actually active in, um, in, um, in the services business and w w I was already in contact with the U.S. Embassy uh, having some some joint projects with uh, with uh, one of the departments there, and I I found out the, about this endeavor, and I, I thought it's it's the necessary step to actually know my market, and um, since we did that in in mid, uh, I think 2019, yes, because of the missing year. Uh, uh, I think that uh, the biggest uh, impact that the event had on us was we definitely changed 180 the view on what we have, on what we sell, on how we position. Uh, basically, after I think after the the event, uh, we uh, soft closed our our um, our uh, investment round. I think in less than six months, and I'm pretty sure that without that event, uh, we we would have worked a lot harder in order to improve our message. What what were the the reasons for that? What what, what was the advice that you can maybe share with our audience as well? Uh, the the um, I I participated in D.C. in Washington D.C. as well in in a separate event in um, in San Francisco. And in both of them, the, the level of business was um, extremely different from the one that we had here locally, which uh, again, the, the biggest change was it made us ask us a lot of questions, which we didn't have up to that point. So uh, the, for the example, uh, the, the improvement in our deck, in our pitch deck before and after I, I think it's, it was monstrous. <laughs> <laughs> so you were challenged a lot uh, by experts yes. from the US, okay. Yes, 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 yes. And um, again, I, I think the, the openness that also Suzanne uh, uh, said earlier uh, actually is, is, a, is a powerful um, uh, point because uh, at least us in Romania, we were more... Uh, we, we don't accept feedback, we don't uh, search for it, we don't push for the negative feedback, we're, we're kind of protective of, of ourselves, but for them it's so much easier to express both positives and negatives, that actually uh, gets you uh, to think of, of, other, of other angles that you have never thought before. Okay, do you, you, Susanna, do you think that this... Uh... Uh, mentality or this mindset in the U.S. that uh, Michna just, just mentioned pushes you to be better? Do you have the same experience? Yeah, definitely. I think one of the most positive surprises for me was that of all people are very open to giving feedback, are very open to in general giving back. Uh, this whole giving back mentality is huge in the U.S. and people love sharing the advice, love sharing the feedback with younger, unexperienced entrepreneurs. And um, 
I, I was just, when I first moved to the US, I didn't know anyone. And so what I did was I decided to write some CEOs on LinkedIn of bigger companies, huge startups, and I just asked for advice. And uh, it was incredible to see how many people actually ended up meeting me for a coffee chat, giving me advice on my, at that time, really small startup uh, while they had a huge company to run. So I think this, this mentality is really valuable. And if you are open to, to receiving feedback, then the US has a lot of that to offer. So would you, would you say that uh, just go for it and uh, like write to Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg if you feel like? I mean, how, how open is the local community? And do you feel welcome there as a, as a startup? Do you feel, uh, as a foreign startup, do you feel welcome there in the market? Yeah, I would say, um, I mean, probably not Elon Musk and <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg, but overall, I, I do think that um, people do welcome you in this, in this startup ecosystem, especially those bigger startup hubs like Silicon Valley or New York or even Miami. They have such an international crowd of people overall and so many events uh, before the pandemic, of course, and so many opportunities for you to meet people. And what I've also realized is that people do not shy away from introducing you to others in the US. And um, they're just happy to, to connect the dots much more, I would say, than in Austria. And so I think you do get the chance to, to build a network very easily in the US. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't need to, to be you know, shy or unsure about it. Uh, I think you just have to do the first step. And th definitely the first few networking events are a little awkward. But after a while, you also realize that you're starting to meet the same people over and over again at the same events. And you're starting to build your own network very quickly. How but of course, these accelerator programs or other you know, governmental programs help a lot to, to get that first step into the market. How is, how is the legal status of entrepreneurs, foreign entrepreneurs? Do you need some working permits or how does that work? Yeah, so visa is definitely a big subject that you have to consider before going to the US. I mean, if you're just visiting, you can go on an ESTA um, and that is, that is easy. You just apply online, it takes a few, few minutes and you can basically travel there and be there for three months. Um, other than that, there is an entrepreneurship visa that allows you to stay there for, for your business and work on your business uh, for an unlimited time, I believe, or longer time at least, um, as long as you have your business. Uh, but to be honest, the visa uh, situation is definitely something that may hinder you from fully entering the U.S., um, but that is also why I would suggest just going down an ESTA first or on a business visa and uh, learning more about the market first before going into the whole visa process, because um, there's a whole ABC of visa categories that you could consider. Um, and I know a lot of entrepreneurs that have a variety of different visas that uh, they've applied for and also gotten, but it is a process that is definitely not easy. Is there a fast lane for entrepreneurs? Um, what I only can recommend is it's, it's really depending on the on the setup what you're planning to do, and uh, I can only recommend to speak to our experts at the consulate that are super fast in responding. Uh, really, um, um, I, I'm, I'm so happy that we have them and are able to guide you in the right direction. Uh, at the moment, the uh, situation is not so easy to travel to the US, but I'm very, very confident that as soon as the situation with the pandemic is getting better, it will be getting easier as well to travel to the US. Michna, do you have employees in the US? Yes, we do. We, we have one employee and one uh, contractor. And we're planning actually to, to build up the, the US team as a uh, business, uh, as a revenue generator there, uh, like the business development and sales. Uh, and to have in Romania the product development and support. And what is, what is your experience with employing somebody in the US? Is it something similar from what we know in Europe or some advice on, on, that, on that piece as well? I, I, I think the process from, from our experience uh, was similar. Uh, the, the costs are uh, definitely uh, different, uh, at least uh, with the ones that we have in Romania. So that was, uh, that was a bit of a shocker, but we were expecting it, we documented it. So we had it in our, in our business plan. But I think the process is pretty, it's, it's basically the same. We have the same flows in Romania as well. Okay. So nothing there, just uh, maybe because 
uh, it's not it's not about a, 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 an employee, a possible employee in the local market where you can uh, give a couple of phone calls and you can find some feedback out of the out from the market itself. Uh, in the U.S., I at least we did a little bit of uh, background check as. Uh, the as Google allows us to, uh, in order to make sure that everything is okay, everything that's stated uh, uh, checks checks up. Okay. Um, just one additional comment regarding finding employee number one in the US. This is maybe the hardest element of setting up. Um, the reason is that you are competing with big brands, like you mentioned, Mr. Musk, uh, but also Google and so on. So there is lack of talent and there are other very strong brands and as an Austrian startup or international startup entering the US you start, you're starting to build your brand and um, what I would advise and, and Misha mentioned it isn't cheap to hire and um, I wouldn't recommend to go for the cheapest offer. Um, you will get what you pay for, right? And it can happen then after six months you realize um, your colleague in the US said he's building a pipeline, but at the end uh, he has a side job and he didn't do anything. So it's, you need to be very selective, need to find somebody who's really sharing your vision. Ideally, maybe your client becomes your first number uh, one employee, or you have uh, somebody like you, Susanne who's going over and really building up the team. This can make a big difference, and it's really a, a make or breaker and really important for the first year. Very interesting. Susanne, how was that in your case? Yeah, I would, I would agree that finding talent in the U.S. is not an easy task. Um, at least it wasn't for us because, as you said, Jan, there's just so much competition, and you really have to pitch your company to the good talents in order to choose to, for them to choose you. Uh, so I find in, in Europe, at least, it's a little easier where you can actually pick among a great pool of, of talent versus in the U.S. to really find a great talent. Um, I guess it's just more competitive or it's unaffordable. And for us, it was also a big shock to see what um, even junior people were expecting in terms of salary. And um, you just have to think twice sometimes if you really want to, if it's really necessary to hire in the U.S. or if you can... Well, what you can already do maybe from, from other countries. And we, for example, in our business plan, had plans to get much more of, grow our US team uh, much bigger by now. And then of course, because of the pandemic, we realized that we don't really need people in the country at this point in time because there are no physical meetings anyways. And so that is also why we shifted some of the resources back to Europe, just because it is um, just much, much cheaper to be honest. So that is always a consideration, unfortunately, to have is, is the budget that you have available and how much you are getting, um, how much return you're getting on that investment. I mean, uh, the, the labor costs are, are obviously much, much higher. How is the investment situation? We talk about uh, money, availability of money, follow up rounds. Is that much easier? Do they uh, immediately speak about higher numbers that you maybe wouldn't be able to get in Austria? Do you have any experience on that or in Romania? So, I mean, I can jump in real quickly. We had um, definitely in our first investor meetings a completely skewed uh, image, uh, image of what we could get as, a, as an investment sum. And now I've realized after a while that the U.S. is just much, thinks much bigger in terms of how much um, we in our stage could raise. And so uh, we're talking about like almost double the size that we would mention in, in the US versus in, in Europe. At the same time, it is also more expensive to be in the US market. You need, as I said, more uh, money for human resources. You also need much more budget for, to actually compete uh, in terms of marketing and sales in this market. And so uh, it's just a, a more expensive market overall. So I think mm -hmm. it makes sense that, it, that the numbers are higher. And um, I also what I've what I've realized in in the U.S. Um, is that it's a lot about storytelling and a lot about how you sell your vision versus just showing hard facts or a product. Um, and I think that is that was a key learning for us is to really shape our story, shape our pitch, and get people excited and create a momentum for it. And we are going to raise our next round in a few months, and I'll. Be happy to share my learnings from that. Um, but our first round was, was were much smaller, so it was quite easy for us to get it, or easier than in the U in Europe. I said I would say. Are you going to try to raise it in the US? Yes. Yes. Um, that, 
and yeah and and, and and selling selling your vision and 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 focusing on storytelling on your pitch the towards the investors or all over the place towards employees towards investors towards uh, potential clients is that relevant on all levels yeah i think in the us um communication is just it seems to be much more important than the way you you sell this big vision and i think that is helpful in on all levels on uh, getting clients getting investors getting employees on board um i at least from my experience with um, talking with uh, investors in the in Austria, it was much more about showing the product, showing our team, showing the uh, numbers that we had, and and more of like the hard facts. And I do feel like in in the US you can actually raise much more if you're really good at storytelling. Um, but it's also a skill to learn, and it's not an easy skill. I mean, Michna, you said as well that uh, your pitch sort of got um, exponentially improved. Does that mean that they don't care about the numbers or do they look at the numbers they, as well? They do, but what I what we've learned uh, was that we we started the other way around mm -hmm. because uh, investors at this level of uh, startup, the early stage startups, they don't focus on having the best product. They invest in, in a team that shows trust that they, that they can actually deliver the promises. So basically everything is more uh, about communication, about setup, about organization, rather than just product. Product is just part of a set of elements. Mm -hmm. And us in, in Romania, as uh, Suzanne stated, uh, we started with product. We developed uh, three years, four years in, and then we wanted to show product, which was fundamentally wrong because <laughs> product uh, first vision and then product delivers. But you have to have the right vision to have this, the right scalability. You have to have the right values that your business can take off mm. because that's the selling part. And then it's your job to execute. Would you guys say that this is something, because it's super interesting, um, do you, would you say that this is something which is important to understand in order to approach the US market? Or would you say after this experience that this is something that you would advise to any founder worldwide? To, to anyone. Okay. I, I, I think I, I've learned the hard way uh, this. We, we invested time and money and everything. And then we had to change certain parts we had to adapt to the reality and it's always easier to have your reality reality uh, uh, stated to have a, a north metric star to have uh, uh, um, marketing interviews with potential customers to have just mock-ups to see how the average user uh, interacts with your idea to have everything set up before actually uh, dive in in the in the product development. Mm -hmm. Susanna that was, was my, Susanna yeah. was nodding. I guess you have the same experiences. Uh, yeah, exactly. You were sort of enriched by that by that learning from there. Yeah, so I, I think we also spent way too much time in the beginning on product without um, thinking about the big vision and talking enough to our customers. So that was definitely a key learning. And I think of all. For anybody going into the US, even if it's just for a few weeks to learn that mentality to understand how they do things is, I think, super valuable, even if you then decide to go back to Europe and continue your, your company in Europe, I think you would have a really good head start if you mm -hmm. learn from from the best in the US and they do have um, just a lot of things figured out, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And one other thing that I would like to add in terms of fundraising, which was also quite surprising for me, was that um, the thing that I said before with introductions and how easy it is to get introductions, I think it's the same for fundraising. You just have to play that game of asking for introductions and building a network and building relationships. And um, it's not so easy to access um, great investors, but if you have a, a network, then, then it's of course much easier. And 
one thing that, for example, we've been using uh, recently a lot is asking founders for introductions and not only, and also other investors that we talk to, asking them again for introductions. So really just using this introduction game in order to build up a network of potential investors. And the other thing is that you should, at least that was our experience, that it's not easy to just enter the market and like you, you, you have a PowerPoint presentation and two weeks later you have money in, a, in your bank from an investor. It is a process and it, I think especially as a founder who's not originally based in the US and who doesn't already have the huge network from maybe a, a top university or from the, just living in the US, uh, it just takes a little longer than you might expect to actually get investments. So yeah. Yeah, um, to, keep that in mind. I would just, say. just one sentence to add. Um, so understanding the VCs in the US, you also have to understand the startup landscape there. And looking, for example, at AI, we have 6,000 uh, companies in the field of AI. So the competition is quite fierce, uh, so kind of 10x compared to Europe in some sectors. And uh, if you are the U.S. investor or we see, you maybe would prefer to invest in a U.S. solution. But in the moment when you have a European startup that has a presence already in the U.S., a small team, um, done all the, uh, let's say, branding has the .com domain and basically the look and feel that it's a U.S. solution, it's much easier for the U.S. VC to identify and say, okay, I'm, I'm going for this solution, especially if it has some USP that is outstanding and it's better than the solution that's already existing. So on the other side, we heard yesterday in the Clubhouse talk that a lot of UC, uh, U.S. VCs are now in Europe. Yeah. That's and actually, it should get easier to, to Pandemic find. dynamic, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're opening offices in France and, 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 and Germany and maybe Austria. That, that was quite a, it's a recent development, that, uh, as we could hear. Can you just, I mean, we, we, we hear a lot about 90-second speech and elevator pitching, and you can just pitch your idea all over the place. Do you have this experience that if you see some investors in a coffee shop, you just approach them and say, hey, can I, can I pitch my idea to you? Or is that a story? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I definitely, especially in Silicon Valley, um, I was part of this Go Silicon Valley program uh, and in the US as well. And um, we spent a few months in the in Silicon Valley and it was crazy how often I had to pitch, pitch our product. And even when I was sharing an Uber with people, it was like, I was pitching, then the other person was pitching. Uh, then, like one time, even an Uber driver was pitching his startup <laughs> because he was outside, you know, driving Uber. So it was crazy to see how much this pitching mentality is there. And so you really have to. I know they always say that this elevator pitch. You just really have to practice this and, um, yeah, get used to that that kind of mentality, which is which can be quite exhausting too. If it's yeah. always about it's not always about pitching, but it's also a fun game. Always in performance good. mode, huh? Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll just add one thing here. Um, if you start working on a product before the story, imagine how you can put in 30 seconds or less three years of work and yeah. choose the right functionalities, choose the right words that will get you your next meeting. That's heartbreaking. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, you want to share everything, all the nights of hard work and weekends of hard work yeah. you want to share. But it's it more about, uh, do you have any no-goes um, that you would, that you could share with us? No-goes. Um, I don't know. I think that overall, um, you should just really think about the, the going into the U.S. And, and the costs and the, um, not only the cost for building a company, for you know, tax advisory, for legal advisory, mm. for employees, for um, even living expenses. It's just a lot of commitment. So I think uh, just calculating that in and figuring out at what stage to go into this, com uh, into this country. I don't think it's really, I, I believe that um, the way we have it and also Michna, it sounds like you have it set up that you have a the development team in Europe and then the um, the the business development team in the US. I think the setup is really uh, valuable because you save a lot of money uh, on the development and you get a really good skilled team while being in the market in the US. And that is also in a way our plan or where we're heading. Um, but that is something that you can only do once you already have something to sell, because there's no point in entering too early without a ready product and then sitting in a, 
in a tiny room in New York paying a fortune in rent and um, just working on the product. Is, then that, a, well is that a competitive Europe. advantage of European startups moving to, to US compared to the ones who are in the US? I would say so. I think that a lot of our competitors have had, um, a lot of our direct competitors have spent much more money on building the exact same functionalities that we have. And um, I think that in general, European company, companies are often a little more cost conscious and um, because uh, we just have maybe less um, access to a lot of funding. So we're trying you know, to, to bootstrap in the beginning much more, I would say. And um, I've also had the experience that in investor meetings, this fact that we have our development team in Austria and we're keeping it in Austria was um, definitely not a disadvantage. Um, if, if I think it was probably even an advantage. Or so they don't, don't demand for the whole team to move to the US? That was, at least for us, never the case. Michna? No, neither for us. Uh, Romania has a long-standing uh, uh, line of IT people uh, for 30 years in the States. We, I think we are quite respected in this industry. But the difference of cost between Romania is, and U.S. is so staggering that any investor sees huge value in it. So... But I would, I would add as a don't, uh, at least when you're small, when you're a startup, don't try to educate your market. Try to find a problem that exists, that is known, and try to fix it in a simple way. Mm -hmm. uh, if as, as a startup, you start uh, trying to change people, trying to make them see anything in your business model, uh, then the, your chances are, are small because you don't have the power of, of the investment money in order to generate that need. You have to go on an existing need. Uh, also, uh, I would say that, uh, again, uh, valid for, for Romania, maybe more than, uh, than Austria, is the fact that, again, from, from the uh, three key points, which is product, marketing, and sales, we all always start with, with product. I think marketing should be number one in exploring the go-to-market strategy and the product market fit. If you have a marketing validation, then you can go to a sales and product, just in this order. Never start with product. Again. And uh, maybe uh, uh, another thing which might be peculiar to, to Romania uh, is embrace criticism. Again, we, what I consider a huge value to the U.S. Uh, entrepreneurs and people is that they enounce, enunciate much easier also the, the minuses, which you have to take and embrace them and use them in your path and not to take them personally. I think that's, uh, that's a huge change that you have to, to, to be able to do. Otherwise... It, it could be a problem for you, for you and your business. Feedback is the breakfast of champions, so to say. <clears throat> yes. Such an interesting talk. I mean, I, I, I'm afraid I could go on for, for hours, Jan. Yeah, yeah, I've only one don't that I would love to add. Um, so the US is one country, but actually you have to see it almost as a continent. And if you try to conquer the US in one go, it's quite a difficult task. So you maybe should focus on a niche, maybe on one state, on one target group. And talking about clients, don't go for the very big tickets at the beginning. Maybe a medium-sized uh, company will be easier, less bureaucratic, less red tape, easier to convince of your solution. And you will learn so much, then adapt your product and then already for the next group of clients, next state, ne next region. So I would go in a step-by-step -step, uh, process in mm. Let's say that's interesting. In Let's just briefly uh, um, reflect on that because we hear a lot the advantage of the US is it's such a huge big market. You have one product and you have like 300 million of, of potential customers. But what you advise here is now to focus maybe um, and, and to take into account that there are 52 different countries. Yep. It's, it's very much depending on the solution. If you have a consumer app, this easily can be rolled yeah. out. But if it's a healthcare product, there could be different regulation in each state. Each state, okay. Any, any learnings on that from your side, Susanna? Yeah? So for me, I guess um, 
it was just uh, the fact that you have to also consider, for example, when you're hiring people in different states, you also have to think about how, what kind of implications that has on taxes, which I completely um, did not think about <laughs> upfront. Um, that, for example, when we're hiring somebody in a different state, that if that person is doing sales or creating value for our company, it might uh, change the way we, we have to pay taxes in different states and also register in different states. So that was a, a like interesting thing, learning for me. Also the fact that um, VAT laws are very different in each state. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, what kind of sales taxes you have to pay in each state is, is also so would you still a little bit of a, uh, a zone that I have not completely understood yet. <laughs> would you compare it to, a, let's say, Austrian startup trying to sell their products to France and Germany and uh, Ireland and I don't know what? Is it, is it comparable or is it more harmonized and easier? I would say it's comparable. Okay. But... I mean, we have not reached in certain states, we've not reached the thresholds yet where it becomes very complicated. Um, so I'll, I'll be able to know more about that in a, in a few months, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> Mikna, you have any, any learnings on that? Well, I, I think what Jan is saying is perfectly true. You can either learn it from, from him or you can learn it by, by the hard way because <laughs> We had we 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 jumped a few steps and had some discussions with some bigger names and bigger players, which validated the product. But the second question after product was, how many existing customers? What's your traction in the U.S.? So hitting bigger tickets, uh, at least uh, as a startup, as a, a new guy on the block. Definitely, you need uh, some some uh, uh, easier targets just to to show the, the the necessary traction and trust, because the big the the big uh, possible customers will never go for your solution if it's not validated in the market. Mm -hmm. Very interesting talk. That's a good good uh, so to say closing remarks so that we can say again yes if you are anticipating to enter the u.s market there is jan and his colleagues and in june we have select usa summit uh, maybe a final call so to say if you want anybody yeah, to join yeah. maybe uh just one important learning i think is really uh it boils all down to engage early so um engage with people that help you and um, i'm more than happy to help um any startup scale up or um, a company that is planning to set up a um, shop in the US or plans to grow. Uh, we have this event coming up, the summit in June. Um, the website is selectusasummit.us. It's a great program. Just have a look. And if you want to learn more, I'm more than happy. Please get in touch. Yeah. Susanne, Michna, thank you very much for taking time for this talk, for all the insights. I found it super interesting. Kind of like a few new aspects that I've learned from this talk. Thank you for taking your time. Jan, thank you for organizing this talk and for all the insights and learning.